to our final. It's never the final in God's Word, though. Just the final of a series we've been looking at on blessed assurance that the believer has in Christ. And John gives us quite a bit of that in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so we're going to wrap it up this morning on this one of our final. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 9. 1st John chapter 3. 1st John chapter 3 this morning as we take a look at abiding in and conquering through Christ. John tells us that you and I can have blessed assurance of conquering, having victory in our lives if we will continue to abide in Christ. Now that's the key to it, and we're going to look at that, and we have that in one of our verses here. Our key verse of here is going to be found in verse 6, will be our text verse here as we take a look at it. And uh, verse 7 as well, we'll take a look at. But we're going to look at all these verses this morning as we come to a conclusion of our series on Blessed Assurance. If you missed out on any of it, we do have it online. It is on our website. It is on our YouTube, uh, probably even up on Facebook. And you can download the study guides. And then you can always get it right here out on the table. And so there I say that for those of you that are with us on Facebook, those that are on YouTube and watching and so forth, all of this is available to you through our website, through our ministry, and it's absolutely free. We charge nothing for it. And so you can call in, write in, email, or go on the study guides and even download the study guides. So they are available for you. So we encourage you to pick them up if you miss anything or in a series. The only thing we do ask occasionally sometimes for a little help is if you actually want a series. And we're talking about, you know, anywhere from 6 to 12 DVDs and all of that and put all that together. We just ask for a gift of any amount to help cover the cost of that. But if it's just one or two, absolutely no charge whatsoever. Download study, guys, there's no charge. So we want to be a blessing to you. and We want you to study the Word of God with us and be enriched in your lives through the ministry of the Word, of teaching the Word, of changing lives one verse at a time. And so we encourage you to tune in with us. And so thanks for watching today. All right, well, let's get into the Word this morning, abiding in and conquering through Christ. Follow along with me as we read this morning in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 4. Notice what our brother John says. Whosoever, that means anybody, committeth sin, transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, that is Christ, and in him, that is in Jesus, is no sin. Now whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Read that again. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, that is Christ, is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, made known, revealed, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So may we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. And uh, Lord, we know your word is serious. And it's pretty black and white what we just read Lord, we're going to ask for your Holy Spirit now to come and give us instructions and to guide us into all truth and to reveal to us the truth. Lord, give us illumination, understanding of the inspiration of the God-breathed Word and what John is saying to us as believers and as to others. And so, Lord, we ask for wisdom. We ask for guidance. We ask for anointing. We ask for your power to be upon your servant and anointing upon your servant in this hour that you would give him clarity of mind, that you would bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Father, we pray that we'll make it clear and plain that everyone can understand it, even a young person. 
when it comes to the, what we're talking about today. And so, Father, we pray that you would save souls for Jesus' sake that's lost without Christ. Father, we pray that you would bring and draw believers closer to you today concerning this matter. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory as we take an examination of ourselves in the Word of God today. And we'll give you all praise and glory and thanks. And we'll ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And praise the Lord. Well, John tells you and I that we can conquer sin in our lives by abiding in Christ. There is victory, okay? And so we're going to take a look at that this morning, and uh, we're going to look at number one here. We're going to turning away from sin and its enslavement. Turning away from sin and its enslavement. That's why we're going to be looking at, starting next Sunday night, out of bondage. So you don't want to miss that series as we begin to get into it. But let's take a look at it all. First of all, we need to understand John makes this declaration of sin in verse 4. He makes this declaration of sin in verse 4. He said, notice what he tells us, that those of us that do and commit it, we have transgressed the law of God. In other words, we have violated God's law. We have gone beyond uh, God's law. We, we've been overpressing God's law. We've gone beyond that and violating all of God's law. Notice what he says, whosoever committeth. The word committeth is a present participle which means a continual repeated action. Okay, so whosoever continually repeatedly sins all the time, transgresses or continually repeated, that's, where, that's why you put that E-T-H on the end of it there, and that word continually repeatedly violates God's law, overpasses God's law, you see, and all of His laws. Who, whoever, whoever does this, does that is what He says to us. For sin is the transgression of the law. So we have to understand there is the transgression. First of all, John declares of the declaration of sin. How many believe that there is sin in the world today? How many believe that we're all sinners, saved by God's grace? And, so we, and we've all transgressed God's law. Can we all agree on that? Okay, because there's no sinless person in here. No sinless person in here. Okay, no perfect person in here. Okay, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And John's talking about here if we continue in that sin or sins. We repeatedly, we live in it, we practice it, we, um, we, we become a part of it in our lives uh, you know, on a continual basis. Then we have definitely, we are continually transgressing the law and the moral laws of God. And we need to understand that. And so let's take a look at it a little bit here. I found, well, here's a good spot right here to start with. Romans chapter 3. Follow along with me there in your study guide, if you would, in your notes. As it is written, okay, we get right off the bat here. Paul is quoting in the Old Testament. As it is written, there is none, when I pause, that's for you to talk. There is none righteous, how many? No, not one. Remember, he's talking about who's committed sin. There is none that understand. There is none that seeketh after God. How many don't understand? How many don't seek after God? None. So that means you and me. Are you with me? They are all. How many? They are all gone out of their way. They are, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace uh, have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. That describes America today in the average person. Can I get an amen? Now we know. Say that we know. What do we know? That whatsoever things, soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty. How much of the world? All the world become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So God makes it very clear, the apostle makes it, John does here, makes it very clear 
uh, that there is the declaration of sin, and we just read a little bit of description of it there by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3. All right, and then you can go to Galatians chapter 5 if you want, verses 19 through 21, 17. There are the 17 deeds of the sins of the flesh. Then we can go over to John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world is not the love of the Father, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what John wants us to have victory over but we're not, and conquer, but we have to remain in Christ in order to do so. If not, then we are Constantly committing these things. And so we're going to take a look at it. So we're just describing a little bit about, we all agree that there is sin. I know this isn't a popular subject this morning, but it's in the Bible. And you see, before we can get anybody saved, we got to get them lost. And before they can get saved and get lost, they got to know that they're a sinner. And that they have sinned and broken God's moral laws. And his precepts and his principles and his concepts. You see that they've sinned against God and against heaven. And they need to understand that because we just read there's none righteous. There's none that do good. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. So we're not only going to escape the fact that we're sinners. And that we sin. But some people don't think they are. Matter of fact, there are those that don't think they do sin. Even believers. You go out witness enough and talk to people enough and listen to people, you'll find that they really, you know, because the reason why I think, church, because most believers want to categorize sin. So they give this big list over here of all the ugliness of sin and the wickedness and the evilness of sin. And so they figure, well, since I'm not continually committing and doing those things, I'm okay. But you're not okay. Because then we can list all the sins in the middle don't have time to do that today then we can go and list all these over here that we think nothing of like not praying not reading our bibles not sharing our faith not being a witness not tithing not coming to church oh got quiet in here that's this list of sins but see because we feel we're not in this list we're okay. Well, there is a penalty for sin. So we won't dwell on that too long because I don't want to get everybody out of here with indigestion. But we have to come to the conclusion, folks, to the point that we all sin. And we come short of God. And Paul, John makes it very clear here. He, he, you know, we're, we're going to do these things, but he says if we continually do them, we continually live in them. We continually practice them, and so forth and so forth. He says, you haven't even seen Jesus, and you don't know Jesus. Therefore, you have not been born of God. That's what he said. I didn't say that. That's what the Bible says. That's why you see, well, I'm okay. Over here. I'm, a, but, uh, I'm a struggle maybe a little bit here, but oh, I never, these. Well, that's something you have to deal with God. The penalty for sin, we need to understand that. The world needs to understand that. Those that are watching by Facebook, those of you that are watching on the internet and YouTube and everything, you need to understand that there is a penalty for sin. God is going to judge and punish sin. Now you can either let him do it now by receiving Jesus and letting him pay for your sin, or you will die lost in your sin and you will pay for it. And sadly, it's what a sad thought to know that you die lost without Christ, spend an eternity in a devil's hell for all eternity, knowing the fact that Jesus died for your sin. So there's a penalty for it. Just a few verses. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin, who's that one man? Adam into the world. Entered what, what happened? Sin entered into the world. How many of you were around when Adam was here? Okay, good. And so here's what it is. So death by sin. There's the penalty. Death. So death then, the results of that, passed upon how many in the Greek? What's the Greek word for all? All men for that how many? All have sinned. So there's the penalty for it. Is death. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the victory. There's the conquering. 
James 1.15 says, Then when lust hath conceived, that's one of the ones, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, so forth, okay, okay, it bringeth forth what? Sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Ezekiel 20, 18, 20, in the first part of the verse, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel, in that same chapter, in Ezekiel chapter 18, back up in verse 4, he repeats it twice, The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. So there's a penalty for sin. John makes a declaration that there is sin, and those that commit that sin, there's a penalty of those sins. It's death. But he doesn't stop with that. He, verse 4 says there, as we read in verse 3, verse 4, also tells us that there is a need for deliverance. How many would agree with me? There is a need for deliverance. Why? Because we're under the penalty of death because we've all sinned. All right, are you with me? Say amen. So there's the need for deliverance. So why do we need this deliverance? Because man is sinful. Man is sinful. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. How many? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God or have missed the mark. Now why is that? Because A there, he practices sin. There are those that practice sin. He chooses to sin, and he sins by birth. Romans 5, 12 again. Wherefore, by one man centered into the world, and so death passed upon sin, uh, because all have sinned, right? Because of Adam. We inherited the, the sinful nature from Adam. Therefore, we need deliverance. Then man needs deliverance not only because he practices sin, not only because he chooses to sin. And boy, does the world choose to sin. Wow, you ought to see it. It's, it's, a, oh, it's amazing out there. We have something going on down south in the middle in Orlando, something called Pride Gay Week. Celebrating. That's a choice. They choose to sin. Hello. Therefore, and they do it because they were born. Not born that lifestyle, but born sinners. Because of their... The Adamic nature they inherited from Adam. Therefore, they need deliverance. Okay? Then, you see, man, because man is sinful, not only because he practices it, not only because he chooses it, not only because he's born with it, he breaks the law of God. He breaks God's law. Okay? Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, oh, God forbid. Nay. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So we break God's law, His principles, His precepts, His concepts, His moral laws, because of sin. Sin has to be eradicated. There's only one person that can do that. Jesus Christ is the only person that can eradicate your sin and my sin. He's the only person that can, can forgive me of my sin and your sin. He's the only person that God would accept his sacrifice and his death on the cross for your sin and my sin. Nothing else would have appeased God or satisfied God except the perfect Lamb of God, the spotless, sinless Lamb of God that died and shed His blood that you sang about about 20 minutes ago. What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make you whole again? Nothing but the blood. There's power in the blood. I'm redeemed by the blood. You see, it's the blood of Christ that washes, eradicates my sin and your sin. So therefore, man needs deliverance. John wants us to understand this. He makes this declaration that there's a sin problem that, we're, that affects all of us. Let me tell you something. Man's been infected with sin since the beginning of time. I'm just telling you the truth from the Bible because I love you. And that's the only thing that's going to eradicate and have a cure for the sin problem. Oh, my. And it's a cure for even the, what's going on. 
Because, friend, if you die from what's going on, you still had better have Jesus or you're going to be in bad shape for all eternity. So John makes this declaration that everyone is a sinner and they need a, a deliverance, you see. Oh, then he, goes, then he says in verse 5, he begins to reveal it to us. Look at verse 5 with me. Number two in your study guide today. The manifestation of Christ. This is the revealing, the making known, the uncovering, and showing of Christ. First of all, this, this is going to be the provision for deliverance. This is going to be the cure for the infection. Are you with me? Those that are infected with sin, here's the cure. Here's the deliverance. Here's the provision, you see. And, and, and God didn't go to uh, the scientist. He didn't go to get a, 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 a shot. He went to the cross for Christ. The provision of deliverance, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus Christ. Because first of all, we ought to understand, first of all, He came in person. How many agree with me? He came in person. Man, there's like over 300 prophecies concerning His first coming in the Old Testament alone. But Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, For unto us a child is born, that's his humanity. Unto us a son is given, that's his deity. Isaiah prophesied the fact that Jesus was coming, that God was providing a cure for the sin problem, for deliverance. Oh, he came in person. We go to Matthew's gospel, Matthew 1 and 18 through 25, and Luke 1, 31 and 32 and 35, and Luke 2, 6 through 7, 11 through 12, 16 through 17. We find that the story of the birth of Christ, and that he came, and that she conceived, and she delivered, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. <laughs> Are you with me, Okay. And thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which is being an interpreted God with us. That's his incarnation. So he came. I want you to know he came in per person in John, 1 John 4, 9, just a chapter over from where we're at. Listen to what John says. In this was manifested, made known, revealed, what? The love of God to what? Towards us. Now, well, how was this made to us? Because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. That we might have life through Him. That we might have deliverance through Him. That we might conquer sin through Him. There it is, you see. So He came in person. I notice what else? He came without sin. He came without sin. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the apostle gives to us in the Word of God, for He, that is God, hath made him, that is Jesus, to be what? Made him to be sin for who? For us. Now why is that? For who knew, that is Jesus, who? Jesus knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Hebrews 4.15, the Bible says, He was yet without sin. He was tempted in all areas as we were, were yet without sin. So Jesus came in person, church. For our deliverance. He came to be our Savior. He came to be God with us. He came to forgive us. To cleanse us. To wash us. To give us victory. To conquer over sin, hell, death, and the grave. And the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. That is of the world. He gave all of that to us in the person of Christ. And he came without sin. Because he had to be the perfect sacrifice for God. He had to be the lamb without spot and without blemish. And he was, my friend, he was. But not only did he come in purpose, see, we're looking at the provision of the deliverance. See, you can't deliver yourself. No faith, no denomination, no preacher, no body can deliver you. Only Jesus Christ can deliver you. He's the provision that God gave to us so we could have complete deliverance. Is in the person of Christ, not in a, a, a church, not in a denomination, not in a faith, not in a spiritual leader, but in the person of Jesus Christ. So God provided us, thank you, sister, the provision. Aren't you glad God provided it? Because you and I couldn't. We are almost men without hope. So thank God for it. So he came without sin. He was that perfect sacrifice. And he came to redeem us. There's the purpose. 
He came to redeem us. Listen to what the, the apostle says in Romans chapter 5. But God, say that with me. But God, what did God do? He commendeth. He proved, he demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not the church died for us, not a denomination died for us, not a spiritual leader or guru died for us. No, Jesus died for us. And when, notice when he did it, that while we were yet sinners. See, there's our deliverance of our dilemma, you see. Christ died for us much more than being now justified, saved, how are we justified? By his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It doesn't get any more powerful and clearer than that. All right, so we've seen the declaration of sin. We've seen the penalty for it. Then, therefore, we saw the need for deliverance, and that was to be provided by God. There was the provision that was the manifestation of Christ. There was the provision for it. Then we saw that, what, he, he came in person. He came without sin. He came to redeem us. Well, let's look at the work now. We're going to get down to more of the nitty-gritty here. The work or proof of deliverance. Are you with me now? Here we go. There needs to be some proof. There needs to be some work and some proof that you and I have been delivered. Here we go. First of all, John tells us there, if you read with me in the verse, in verse number 6, notice what he says. First few words there. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, the word sin that there is a present participle. It means one doesn't continue to live in sin. One doesn't continue to practice sin. One doesn't consider to waller in it, make it a part of his lifestyle, and the way he's living. And believe me, unfortunately and sadly, we have some believers that live that way. Okay? But unfortunately, so, so the proof that I have been delivered is that I'm abiding in Christ. Listen to what 1 John 2.28 says if you just backed up a page or right across the page. And now, what tense is that? Present tense. Little children, what's the next word? Abide in Him. Now, why do I need to abide in Him since I'm saved? That when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Now tie that in with whosoever committeth sin. What we just read, you see. We deal with the believer. that says they're saved, born again, but they seem to want to continue to practice sin, to choose sin, and to live in sin. Now remember, there's this list, there's the middle list, and there's this list. Okay? If we're living in any of these lists, not that we're perfect, but we're continuing, practicing, habitually, living, choosing, everything. Are you with me? Then that believer is going to be, according to verse John 2.28, is going to be ashamed at his coming. Because they're living in sin. They're continually practicing and choosing to live in sin. They're going to be ashamed at his coming. That those of us that are not, we're not going to be ashamed. Now, for the lost man, he's not even going to see Jesus. He doesn't even know Jesus. So, you see, we, that's why this is so important. So, we're to abide in Christ. We're to live in Christ. See, the proof, the work of my deliverance, the proof of my deliverance is that I'm abiding in Christ, that I'm living in Christ. Galatians 5, 16, this I say then. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain in Philippians 1.21. Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses. I am crucified with Christ. What's that? That's a death, crucifixion. Nevertheless, I live. Well, how can I live if I've died? Yet not I 
but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I'm to live in Christ. Then notice what he said in those verses, that we do not continue to sin. Are you with me? Verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Are you there? Verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him, that is, if you're abiding in Christ, sinneth not. But whosoever sinneth, here's that continueth repeatedly, hath not seen him, neither know him. See, Paul, look at verse 8. He that committeth sin, notice we have the ETH, that's present participle, continually, repeatedly, what we've been talking about, all right, is of the devil. Oh, preacher, don't tell me I'm of the devil. Well, if you're committing sin and continually doing it, the Bible says you're of the devil. I don't want to hear that. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't write the book. I just quoted. Boy, I tell you, getting awful quiet. Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul put it this way. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 15 of chapter 6. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. See, there's a crowd that has gone around for a while. I mean, just in these past 10 years, several things have popped up in the theology circle uh, again, as it always does as time goes on every now and then. One of the big ugly heads that popped up here not too long ago was Calvinism popped back up and was going around pretty strong. That is the five points of Calvinism. Limited atonement, limited grace. I do not agree with that. I do not hold to that. But that was popping its heads up. And, and, and all part of that is election in there. Okay? You were elected to save, you're elected to go to hell. So that's it. Forget it. No, I don't agree with that doctrine or teaching. I don't agree in the tulip doctrine of Calvin, the five points of Calvinism. Then there's the super Calvinist. That's the seven points of Calvinism. Then there's the hyper super Calvinist. Hyper super expialidocious. Don't say it fast. And that's the 10 or 12 points of Calvinism. God does not have limited grace, His grace is for all. God does not have limited blood atonement. He died for the sins of the whole world. He died for the sins of all mankind. God didn't put His Son through all of that agony and torture of a human being on the cross just for a handful of you and let the rest of you go to hell. But that popped its head up. Then after that, another one popped up here recently in the last few years. Last few years it's called replacement theology. That the church has replaced Israel. I disagree with that teaching and doctrine. The church has not replaced Israel. Israel is still the apple of God's eye. Israel is still the wife of Jehovah God. And God has just put Israel aside for right now and is dealing what we call the church age, the age of grace, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church in the New Testament. But he's going to pick up again and pick up with his people Israel when the tribulation starts, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, and God will once again deal with his people. But the church has not replaced Israel. That's another doctrine that popped up. Then recently here, this doctrine, what I just said. There are those that say, well, now this is coming from believers. Quote, well, we can go out and sin more so that we can have more grace. I do not agree with that because Paul said, what, shall we sin more that grace may abound and it may grow more, even more, and more of God's favor? Paul says, God forbid, may that never be. 
But we've got that crowd that thinks we can because we're under grace and not under law. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not under the law as far as salvation goes because the penalty for the law was death. Jesus took care of that for me. But I'm still under the law of God's precepts, his principles, his concepts, his Ten Commandments, and all the other laws that God gave me. I still have to adhere to those and abide by those. So we see that we do not continue in sin. Paul made that clear. Why? Because look what he said in verse 6. If we keep sinning, we do not, see, we do not know Christ. Uh, you can't get any more black and white than that. For you that go out there and say, well, it's okay, I'm under grace, I can sin, I can go do this, little sin here, little sin there, everywhere sin here or there, sin, it doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it does. Because John says those that continue to do that, he said, you, don't, you haven't seen God and you don't know God. Now, that's what he said. That's the Bible. We talked about Sunday school. Quit your thinking and throw your thinking out and your reasoning because God says your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. My ways and thoughts are much higher than yours. Well, I'm just going to get some more grace, so I'm going to go sin a little more. No, it doesn't work that way. Well, we have a lot of believers that kind of think that. Okay, verse 8 says different. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. So there was a purpose for this, that God sent his son, amen, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 7 says, if we got this kind of thinking, church, going on, okay, look what he says in verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. Let no religion deceive you. Let no church deceive you. Let no denomination deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody deceive you that you can just go out here and sin and say you've seen God and you know God because John says opposite and I happen to believe the word of God. It's black and white. You need deliverance today. You really do. You need to cure. You need to abide in Christ. Now, let's look at the great conquest of Christ and deliverance. Verse 8. We're almost done. Verse 8. The great conquest, conquest of Christ and deliverance. But first of all, we have to come back to the solemn reality. Look at verse 8 again. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Does it get any more black and white than that? Now you can't say, well, I don't believe that's what it says. I don't believe that's what it means. Well, I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says. John, writing under the Holy Spirit, says, under the inspiration of God, says that he that committeth, continueth repeatedly, chooses to sin, practice sin, and so forth and so on, is of the devil. Ah, uh, don't tell me that, preacher. I'm not. God's telling you. I'm just reading and quoting it. I tell you these things because I love you. Paul says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? No. Your eternal soul's weighed in the balance. That's what I'm concerned about, you see. Where you're going to spend an eternity if you're lost without Christ. There's complete and full deliverance. And if you're a believer and you're struggling, there's also deliverance for you. See, for the lost man, he has to be born of God, verse 9. Hello, talk to me. You know where I'm headed with this, all right? For the saved person, he, to, he's got to, he needs deliverance. He needs to quit practicing it and continuing in it. And that's a choice you and I make. But don't think you're going to get more grace because you do. Not going to happen. So we have to have this solemn reality. First of all, number one, notice the solemn reality of the scripture here now. Verse 8, a person who continues to sin is of the, talk to me church, the devil. Woo, that's hard stuff. Number two, verse 6, we'll back up. He does not see Jesus, and he does not know Jesus. That's in verse 6. So you see, the lost man has no excuse because he's not saved. He's going to do what the natural man does. He's going to keep on sinning and so forth. But you and I that are saved, we're supposed to be dead to sin. We're not to allow sin to reign and rule in our mortal bodies and to obey it and so forth because we're dead to it. We died with Christ. And we were buried with him. 
And then we rose again to walk in a newness of life, to live the resurrected life. And we can if we will continue not to sin, but to continue in verse 6, to abide in Christ. But then the saved person comes along and says, no, no, and they just keep going, they keep sinning. I don't care if it's in this list, this list, or this list, doesn't matter. John says, no, if you continue to do this, and this is what you do, practice, and so forth, and so on, so on, all that I've said, he said, you haven't seen Jesus, you don't know Jesus, and what's the third one? It's of the devil. And you haven't been born again. You say, boy, this is a hard one today. I wish I'd stayed home. Well, me too. It's not easy to preach messages like this. I'm getting pumped up for the one tonight. We're going to get off of this in just a minute. But I'm going to tell you another truth tonight that's just as important as this truth. And you won't enjoy the truth tonight if you don't get a hold of this truth. I care about your eternal soul where you will spend eternity. And for the believer, straighten up, fly right, shape up. Quit living in sin. Quit practicing sin. Quit choosing to sin. Quit going where you don't need to be going. Quit watching what you shouldn't be watching. Quit listening to and reading what you shouldn't be doing. You're supposed to be saved. And, the, and, and Christ is supposed to live in you and abiding in you. And you ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and being led by the Spirit of God, not by your flesh. But John says if you just keep on and keep on and keep it on, he said, you haven't seen him and you don't know him. And all your sinning is of the devil. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to preach it. But God said, you preach it, boy. Because if you don't, you'll stand before me one day and you'll give an account of it. Because you're not going to get anybody saved until they know they're a sinner and that they've sinned against God and it's eternal damnation apart from God. So they need to get saved so they can go and enjoy the celestial splendor of heaven tonight. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to be hard. I'm just preaching the Bible. Verse by verse. Expositional, expository preaching. And teach him because it's one verse at a time that changes lives. Both now and for eternity. And I, you know what? How many of you are over 70 or over now? Raise your hand. Be honest. Come on. 70 and over. Oh, we still have some teenagers in here. Amen. Whether we like it or not, this is the kind of preaching that I was saved under. This is the kind of preaching I grew up under. This is the kind of preaching that called me to preach. This is the kind of preaching that my pastors would look over the pulpit and they were six foot something tall, had a finger eight feet long, and would point it and say, you, you need to get right with God and get saved or you'll spend an eternity in hell. And I'd get up and run down the aisle and get saved, get up and run down the aisle, get called to preach. Hallelujah. Thank God for the preaching of the Word of God. For it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. Hallelujah. I don't apologize for it. And you say it's foolishness. Me preaching foolishness, but not what I'm preaching. But it is the power of God unto them that believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're not the person who continues to sin of the devil. He doesn't see Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus. But we also learn in that verse, in verse there, in verse 8, notice, the Son of God came to earth to destroy the devil's work. Look at verse 8. For this purpose. Now what, what have all we been talking about? Sinning. Amen? And continuing and all of that. And the works of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God who is Jesus, by the way, was manifested, made known, revealed, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, think about that for a minute. Sin is of the devil. It said he did that and continued that from the very beginning. And it infected all of us with it. And Jesus came to destroy it. 
Hallelujah. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. How many of you are partakers of flesh and blood? Okay. And he also, that's speaking of Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. What? Flesh and blood. That's his incarnation. That through death he might destroy him. That is the devil that had power of death and that is the devil. Because the last enemy is death and Jesus came to deliver you and to conquer death for you and for me on his death on the cross of Calvary. Now let's wrap it up and we're finished. Verse 9. I enjoy it because it's the word of God. And it makes me realize what I have. And it causes me to think of what Jesus has done for me. I was a sinner. Lost in sin. Hell bound. But I got delivered. I got the cure, brother. I got the shot. I got the antidote for sin. It's Jesus Christ. Let's look at the results of our deliverance, verse 9. Part of it. First of all, the results of verse 9, our deliverance is we are being freed from living in sin. Because the whole thing he talked about, continueth, committeth, 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 all right? Because of that deliverance, I am free from living in sin. I don't have to live in it. I don't have to waller in it. I don't have to participate in it. I don't have to practice it. I don't have to choose it. Why? I'm free. Thank God, I'm free. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In John 8, 32, and in verse 37, he says, and if you have the truth, which is the Son, you shall be free indeed. So I am freed from living in sin. How am I freed from living in sin as a believer? You might want to write that down, but remember it. By abiding in Christ. Isn't that what he said in verse 6? Look what he said. Whosoever abideth. There's that present participle. Continual, repeated action. Does what? Sinneth. Does, see, the word, there's that TH again. Doesn't say you wouldn't sin. Well, you wouldn't continue in sin. That's how you have victory. That's how you abide and conquer. As you abide in Christ, you conquer sin. Doesn't get any better than that. Now for the lost man, how does he get deliverance today? Verse 9, John said it twice. Are you with me? Read it with me. Whosoever is born of God, that's the new birth born again, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. The way the lost person today has complete deliverance, a complete cure, that does not have to live in sin any longer, does not have to obey sin anymore and its lust, does not have to practice it, does not have to live in it, wallow in it, do it, is by being born again. By being born of the Spirit of God from above. And you have deliverance. And then you can begin to start a new life of abiding in Christ to where you can then begin to conquer sin in your life on a daily basis. But you can't do it apart from being born of God. So John wraps it up as a believer. I have assurance that I can conquer sin in my life by first by making sure that I have been born again and secondly by abiding in Christ. Where are you today? Have you been born again? Are you struggling with this sin problem and practicing it, continuing in it, living in it, wallowing in it? Going, doing, I mean, I just don't have time for all of that today. Then, my friend, there is complete deliverance. 
and it's in the person of Jesus Christ. It's not in the Baptist church, not in the independent Baptist church. It's not in the 1611 only independent, independent Baptist church. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. And not that I'm against all those things I just said. But it's in the person of Christ. It's not in the Baptist denomination. It's in the person of Christ. And the same for you as a believer. John says, you can have assurance of not continuing to sin and to practice it by abiding in Christ. The question is, is are you? Are you and I? Is Christ, first of all, is He abiding in us? And are we abiding in Him? And that's a choice. As you can go over to John's Gospel, in John chapter 15, I believe, it is, I don't know, or 8, 7, and 8, one or the other, one's fruit and the other's abiding. Okay, constantly abide in me, my words in you, and I in you, and so forth. All right, if you want to look up at that on an abiding. So there's victory in Jesus. But all of this was said today for you, the of you that are watching by television, on the internet, YouTube, iPhones, iPads, tablets, Facebook Live right now, is so that you can be born of God and be born again by the Spirit of God from above. And there's complete deliverance. Complete deliverance. Absolute guaranteed. Eternal life, forgiveness, pardon, guaranteed. Even if the nasty stuff that's floating around takes your life, you have the guarantee of heaven. Say, well, it's that that gave it to me, and that's why, and you know, and all this stuff. No, what gave you the infection was called sin that we've all been infected with. And there's no scientist, there's no lab that's going to cure that. The only thing it is is you need a shot of the blood of Jesus from Calvary that cleanses all sin. If you've not been born again, we want to invite you to do so because there can be victory. And for the believer today, stop sinning. Stop living in it, choosing it, going, doing. You're supposed to be dead to it. Christ living in you, the hope of glory, the Spirit of God enabling you and helping you. Because John says, if you don't, and you keep continuing and continuing. He said, you've not seen him. You don't know him. And that sin is of the devil. And you haven't been born of God. It don't get any plainer in these five or six verses we looked at. I'm not trying to be mean or ugly or hard. I'm trying to tell you the truth. Because I want you all to go to heaven with me. And that could be today. Do you realize the trumpet could sound right now? And the shout to come up hither. And the dead in Christ out there will rise first. I was out there Thursday mowing around the mall. And, you know, I was real close to the mower and maybe even slightly bumped one of them or two. I said, oh, that's all right, don't worry. It's just me up here. Everything's going to be fine. The trumpet's not sound. It hasn't been the shout, so it's not blowing off the lid yet. <laughs> but I said, do you all realize some of my brothers and sisters are there? I said, there's a day, folks, you're coming out of that grave. There's going to be a trumpet so loud and a shout so loud, you're coming out. And I'm going with you to meet the Lord in the air. That could happen before we say amen. That's why you better make sure you're saved and you know you're saved and you've been born again by the Spirit of God from above. So I need not to hesitate anymore because the Lord might be coming in just the next few seconds here. So we better get some of you saved. Amen. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes and let's give our audience that's been listening, those of you that are here as well, an opportunity to come to Christ, to be born again, complete deliverance. If that describes you and what we've talked about today, pray. look here, look at me right here. Don't move, don't move off that TV guide. Don't turn it off. Don't click the mouse. Stay right with me. This is important, very important. It determines where you will spend eternity. 
what you do with the person of Christ. We're going to ask you right now to come to Jesus. It's simple. It's not hard. We do it most of the time through prayer, communicating with God. The Bible says we're to confess with our mouth. We're to believe in our heart. We're to call on the Lord. We're to receive Him. That's what we're going to do right now. In this auditorium, those of you that are watching and listening, by whatever means, I want you to pray with me. I want to help you. I want to help you. Simply pray with me. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess after listening to this, God, there's no question, I'm a sinner. And I've sinned against heaven and against you. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe, that's faith, trust, in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he took my place. He paid my sin debt that day on Calvary. He was my provision that God provided for my deliverance. Coming off the message today. I believe now that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so right now by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die or at the rapture, whichever takes place first. I thank you, dear Christ, for hearing and answering my prayer and to giving to me eternal life, everlasting life. And I pray this simple little prayer of faith, believing in Jesus' name, amen and amen.